Okay, we are in section 6.2 star. Again, if you're using the book, make sure you are in the star section on page 438, not 6.2. It's the bluish, if you, if you have the book, it's the bluish part of the book. So we start with the natural logarithmic function. What they do in this book, they separate. They do a natural logarithmic function that is a log with a base of e of x. So a natural log is a log in which the base is e, and if you recall what e is, 2.71282, it's like pi, a very famous number. And then afterwards they do the general log in which the base could be anything. Let's get this out of the way. It has a lot of special properties that we need to get out of the way. They defined the natural log of x to be the integral from 1 to x of 1 over t dt in which x is positive. This x is bigger than 0. So, if I really want to sketch a graph of this function, 1 over t, well, 1, 1, 1 half, 2, and 2, 1. So, the graph looks something like this. And I am going to be looking from 1, there is 1 right there, to x. Well, I have a couple of cases. Let's say assume x, even though it's bigger than 0. Let's assume x is bigger than 1. And I'll talk about what it means if it's between 0 and 1. It really makes no difference. So, natural log of x is pretty much this area. And that's how it works. Now, if I take natural log of x... I'd say that's the integral from 1 to x of 1 over t dt. If I take natural log of 1, that's the integral from 1 to 1 of 1 over t dt. And what do we know? If you don't give the area a width, that's a 0. So that matches our properties, right? And if I take natural log of x and say that's the integral from 1 to x of 1 over t dt. If I decided to switch those and run from x to 1, assume x is assume x is between 0 and 1. Wouldn't that be a negative? Something to keep in mind. And now, the crucial part of this definition, something we avoided in 5a completely. If I am to look at, you know what, I'm going to alter this slightly. I'm going to use this graph instead because I need the space. There, much better. Okay, so the most I'm going to get out of this is something I've been avoiding in 5a altogether. If I have natural log of x equaling the integral from 1 to x of 1 over t dt, I do know that 1 over t is continuous everywhere except at 0, which is not allowed here. That's the condition. So, by fundamental theorem of calculus, I could take a derivative of both sides with respect to x, and I will get the derivative of natural log of x to be, don't you simply plug this in? And there it is. Now I'm going to do a bit better. So the derivative of natural log of x is 1 over x. I'm going to do a bit better than this and I'm going to say, you know what? Let's consider taking a derivative of natural log of absolute value of x. Absolute value has been given us a hard time all along. Why is that? Because you need to get the definition and students seem to not like that. And what if x is negative? True? If x is negative, the absolute value of x would be negative x. And wouldn't this be, and let's see how that works. The derivative of natural log of x is 1 over x if x is positive. And isn't that 1 over negative x times a negative 1 by the chain rule? Doesn't that cancel out? So this means 
therefore the derivative of natural log of absolute value of x is 1 over x that's really my star rule that I need out of this section this is the highlight so this is labeled as property 2 in the book it's so important they gave it a property if you take a derivative of natural log of absolute value of x that's one over x and remember this class is not only the class of derivatives this is the class of antiderivative meaning not only am i going to be going in this direction i'm going to be going in this direction soon all right and by that i'll jump straight underneath it and label property 8 in this section which says if you integrate 1 over x dx which is this route that's natural log of absolute value of x plus c and probably you've forgotten in case you were thinking but wait a minute i knew how to do this well not really because if i wanted to integrate 1 over x dx that's the integral of x to the negative 1 dx if you add 1 to the power and divide by that do you see what happens this was the exception to the rule if you recall the integral of x to the n dx was x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 plus c with a condition with a catch the catch was the catch was provided n does not equal a 1 Does not equal a negative one. This last term. All right. So this is a side note. This is from before. Let me shrink that a bit and keep that as a note. So the power rule that we learned in the previous class had one exception. Well, this is the first one. Guess what? In this class, we're going to tackle all of these exceptions. Let me fix that. There it is fixed. Now, in this class, this is a class of integration. We're going to learn how to integrate pretty much a lot of different functions. I'm going to ask you to memorize four intervals, one of which is a special case of another, so really three intervals. One of them is the integral of tangent of x. If I want to integrate the tangent of x dx, I suggest you memorize this not because it's hard to remember because it comes up a lot it comes up a lot more than you like sort of like when you took a derivative of a square root in the previous class and hopefully your teacher told you well look instead of actually memorizing if instead of deriving that every time just memorize it because it's one fourth of the time that we come across an integral i'm going to work this integral out and show you how this works this is the integral of the sine of x over cosine of x dx. So I'm going to use a u sub, we let u equal the inside of a radical, the denominator of a fraction, right? The power of a function, du will be negative sine of x dx. So this would be my u. And sine of x dx would be my negative du. And by definition, that's negative natural log of absolute value of u plus c. That is negative natural log. And u was, if you recall, the cosine of x. This is a fine answer. This book doesn't do that. Other books leave it like that. This book will take this and as a power property of logs and that would be natural log of 1 over the cosine of x plus c and this book in the back of the book every time you look at those so either you derive this every time and you're going to see it a lot more than you like or you simply memorize it and get it out of the way so it's worth memorizing that the integral of tangent of x dx is actually natural log of secant of x plus c 
or you could say negative natural log of the cosine of x plus. That's one of the four I'm going to ask you to memorize. Either of those two will do. In this book, they use this all the time. I've seen other books that do this. Now, properties of logs and laws of logs. This is a review, something you would need for later on. This is not going to go away. Three properties of logs, and that is, I'll get to that in a minute. Log base A of 1 is 0. If I'm taking the log and the argument, this is called the argument, and the argument happened to be an exponential, then they undo each other if the bases match. If I'm taking an exponential and the exponent happened to be a log, and the base of the log and the base of the exponential match, they undo each other. Log base A of the product turns out to be sum. The quotient is the difference. And raising powers end up being multiplying. That comes from the rules of powers. If you multiply two exponentials, you add their powers. If you subtract two exponentials, you subtract the powers. And if you raise powers, you multiply them. And don't forget, let me give you the definition for a log. I didn't put it here just in case. Definition of a log states if a is bigger than 0 and a not equal to 1, then log base a of x equal y means, or if and only if, means x equals a. This is exponential. This is linear. There is one change of base formula that says if you're taking a log with a base that you don't like, you could change that to log of the argument over log of the base in which the base is your choice. The reason we choose base 10 or base E because our calculators are programmed that way, even though the main calculators have solved that problem. But this turns out to be a very important formula. And the graph of a log, we said the base is bigger than 1 and not equal to 0. The base is bigger than, I'm sorry, the base is bigger than 0 and not equal to 1. So two cases. If I am choosing a base bigger than 1, then the graph really looks like this. The logs are the slowest growing functions. And if I chose a base that is between 0 and 1, the graph will be flat. There it is. So one of those two. All right? And I need that for limits. Now, I am going to go over with you how to graph an absolute value. I do that in my 5A class. But I noticed that most students don't realize how to do this. And this is something that's not going to go away. Uh, and this is really how you do sketch an absolute value. If you look at y equal absolute value of x, I am aware that you know how to graph that. But I want to show you how it really works. You ignore the absolute value. And you graph the line y equal x. Whenever you slow throw an absolute value, if I ignore the inside, y equaling an absolute value, meaning y is always positive. So I go to wherever y is negative, and I reflect that with respect to the x-axis. There it is. So if I want to sketch a graph of y equal x squared minus 4 in absolute value, first I would look at y equal x squared minus 4. Well, I know the graph that. 1, 2, 3, 4. 1, 2, 1, 2. So this graph looks like this. If I slap an absolute value on it, it doesn't matter what's inside. Take this graph, wherever the graph is negative, reflect that and now the graph looks something like this. y equals the square root of x minus 4. If I look at y equals square root of x minus, I'm sorry, minus 2. 4 is on my mind, you'll know why in a minute. So, if I look at this, well, this is a radical shifted two units down. 
and where does that equal zero? That's when radical x equal four. The graph really looks like this. What happens when I slap an absolute value to this? It doesn't matter what that is. Wherever the graph is below the x-axis, you reflect it with respect to the x, and the graph now looks like this. So the actual graph That's with the absolute value, of course, and the actual graph is really this part. And last review of graphs, I have one more graph for you. And if I wanted to look at y equal the absolute value, if I put the x to be the absolute value, well, I look at y equal radical x. So if I put the absolute value along the x, not the y. Well, y equal radical x looks like, actually let me do it here, y equal square root of absolute value of x. I start with this. Well, I know this is a graph that looks like this. So, when I put an absolute value on the x, I'll take whatever this graph is, that will make this an even function, and I'll reflect it. It'll allow x to reflect with respect to the y. So an absolute value around x will reflect the graph with respect to the y-axis. An absolute value on the entire thing, in this case, this has no effect because that's already positive, so that's useless.